this week, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let him, he doesn't yell. So we gave him a microphone so we could turn it up. But I, I, I was thinking, you know, hey, Kelly's preaching this week. This is Kelly. Um, but I was thinking about it as I was coming here today. Like, I don't want to hear from him. I don't want to hear from you. What? No. No, and I don't think that you really want to hear from me. Like, nobody comes here to hear from me. I don't want to come here and hear from you. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I honestly, I want to hear from God. Like, I want to hear from God today. Like, I want, Amen. wouldn't that be awesome if God could, like, throw his voice? <laughs> that would be so Amen. cool, right? If he could throw his voice and it would come, like, out of his lips. That would be the coolest thing. And see, here's the thing. If we ask God to do that, I think he'll do it. I honestly believe it. Deep down in my guts, I believe it. So I want to I want to hear from God today. I got my Bible ready back there. I'm going to listen with my ears open, my heart open. And I want to hear, I want to hear God through this man. You know, so I want to ask you to pray with me for him and that God would use him for that express purpose, please. Father, we thank you for letting us gather here. I thank you for this man. Lord, there's, there's been, uh, this is well documented. I've said it many times. There's, there's been years where I stood alone and you sent uh, faithful men of God like this man uh, to partner here in this ministry. So I am so very, very thankful for him. It is true, Lord. I don't want to hear from this guy today. Nobody here wants to hear from Kelly. Nobody here wants to hear from me. But we want to hear from you. So creator of the universe, would you please speak through this man. Wreck his plan if you must. Wreck him, break his jaw before he says anything that is not of you. We desperately, desperately today want to hear from you, Lord. All of us come here with situations and suffering and all these circumstances in our life. Some of us come to rejoice, Lord. All of us here for different reasons. But Lord, we are here. You have, you have brought us here. No marketing here, Lord. Just you. You've, you've filled this place with people that need to hear from you. So Lord, speak. Speak through this man, please. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Am I on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you guys can actually hear me. First off, I want to thank uh, you guys for coming out and supporting Cree and Mark. This house is packed. And this is great. And, and really, what Moses just said, when I hear God speak tonight, he just did. Twice. Yeah. Twice. I heard it loud and clear. And it brought a tear to my eye. I don't know that I really need to preach because Cree just laid it all out there. I mean, that was it. That's the gospel. She did it. But I'm going to do my best to try to bring a word. I prepared a little bit tonight. And the name of my sermon is, Where Are You Now? Uh -oh. And that's the question. But I'm going to start off with a story. I'm going to rant a little bit. Maybe not like Moses, but I'll do my best. And I'm going to I'm going to draw a little bit on an easel, and I'm going to take and show a little video. Then we're going to get into some scripture. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at uh, verse 22 to 33. But we're going to dissect that and, and finish up with uh, some points that I think are really what Cree and Mark were testifying to. What is it? mean? Where are you at? They answered the question where they were at with Jesus Christ today. And we all have to face that. We all have to answer that question. So to start with my story, we have date night, my wife and I, every Wednesday night. And after a date night started to wind down a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we called our daughter who lives with us at home and uh, said, hey, are you hungry? We'll stop by and pick you something up to eat. And she said, yeah, can I use a hamburger? So we live in Eustis here, and we're headed over, headed over to the Burger King. And there's this line, this drive through line, this just crazy line, right? People backed up, I'm like, I'm not waiting for all that. I'm going in. I walk in, and the place, there's a guy standing there at the front counter. The place is kind of trash. And it's kind of crazy going on. You can, the, there's two employees I can see, and they're scrambling like 
nobody's business to try to get the drive through going. And the manager, at least I think she was, comes up, she's wearing a white shirt, I'm guessing the manager, and she says, we are just, oh, we're so slammed, we're so busy, I've got to go back and help the guy in the back real quick. Can, can you guys just hang out here for a second, and I'll come back and get your order? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Then the next thing that happened was the weird part. She pulls out her cell phone, picks up, dials a number, and heads out the door into the parking lot. And I'm like, what are you doing? I thought you were supposed to help the guy in the back. You're, and, and I could hear her conversation. She's like, yeah, and what did he say? And I'm like, this has got nothing to do with the guy in the back. Your employees are scrambling like crazy. I'm standing here, a customer in line. Who's running this joint? <laughs> Needless to say, I waited for a few minutes and then just gave up and went to another place and got a hamburger. <laughs> but I just wonder, is this what we is this what happens normal? Is this the new normal? Yeah. This is what we kind of come to expect now, isn't it? It, it never used to be this way. That was not normal. You got service when you went into a restaurant. Somebody took care of you. And, and the manager, oh my goodness, they set the pace. It's not what happened this time. Not like that at all. It seems that she didn't care that she had a responsibility at all. There, there was no accountability. I was wondering, who's your boss? Would they approve what you just did? And are we just living in a time where anything goes? Nobody really cares. Because guess what? Well, nobody cares, so why should I care? It doesn't matter. It'll be all right. Well, I used to have a saying when I worked in auto parts about leadership. Because what they would do, what they would send out some rules, I said, you need to start doing this procedure. You need to start working this way. And then off they go. Never realizing what it was like they have to put up with their own rules. Well, it doesn't work real well, does it? And you can't complain about it. So we used to say, well, I can't see it from my house. Meaning, as long as the boss doesn't have to obey his own rules, he in other words, it's not in his face, he doesn't have to deal with it, then what's he here? Once again, where is the leadership in this? Where is the thinking about who is working on you, what these rules mean, what, what happens to all these folks in the, and in the meantime? Well, this makes me mad. I don't like this. I don't like the way this, this works. And I'm going to ask the question once again, where are you now with this? Is this okay with you? Does it sit fine with you? Or does it bug you? Because it bugs the with jeepies out of me. I hate it. <laughs> if personal perception of it's my world and my comfort and my control and my significance, if these are the things that are ruling our lives, which is what this kind of says to me, then we're blind and we're in prison. We're lost. We don't have a clue. And we've given away everything, it seems. And it's rampant. It's everywhere. And does it happen here in the church? Is this the way we treat Jesus? Is this, is this what happens here? That You know, as long as I have a nice comfy chair to sit in, and there's a pretty good band, and there's some good songs, and, and there's some good food, and some folks bring some good food, maybe brought some really good food, and that stuff's all great. But is that what church is about? I don't think so either. But I wonder, is that what the world thinks about us? They think, oh, we're in here just having our own little party. And it's just about the comfort things. Making me feel comfortable. Making me feel significant. Making me feel important. Making me feel like I'm somebody. Me, 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 me. It's all about me. So are we like the world? Are we, 
only paying lip service to this God that we proclaim to follow? And the God being who he is, there's a, is he just patient with us? I think that's for sure. Is he long-suffering with us? With our being all about us, he just puts up with it. But I don't think that's going to happen forever. So who really is in charge? Who's in charge of your life? Where are you at with that? Is it about you? Is it about your comfort? Is it about your significance? Is it about your control? Who sits on your throne that rules your world? Here's why I get to show off my, my art talent. Say this is your world. In the middle of it, it's a throne. I. I'm on my throne. I'm in my world. I'm in my significant, controlling, comfortable little world. And everything is fine as long as nothing disturbs it, right? And where is, and outside here, HS, Holy Spirit. Is this where our church is? Is this the way that is normal for us? We're comfortable with this? Or is there something different? Is there something better? Is this what the, is this what it's all supposed to be about? Maybe, maybe it's your boss that's on the throne. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your mom, your dad, maybe it's you. But we Americans, we're independent, aren't we? We're bred that way. Independent, individualistic. Not thinking in groups, thinking about I. Uh, we're taught that we have rights and we're entitled to be happy. This is the way that we grow up. But if it's different, what would it be like to be part of something better? Something bigger. I ran across. Have you guys seen TED Talks? Yeah. You guys ever watched TED Talks? <laughs> They're just little 10 minute talks or so about certain topics that help educate and enlighten people on topics. And I ran across this one. This gentleman's name is uh, Simon Sinek, I believe. And he talks about leaders and what, how leaders help us feel safe. And what it would be like to have a good leader and a bad leader. So, he's a secular marketing manager. He's talking to a group of company officials. Keep that in mind as he talks. But see if you can't listen for, and we'll go through after the video, listen for Christ in this. Listen for principles out of the Bible in this, and see if you can't pick up on something. He's not going to mention God or Jesus Christ, but see if you can't hear those very things. It's not working. Hey, uh, computer's crashing. It's crashing? It's crashing. Okay. Only because we prayed for it not to. You know that. <laughs> Or we can do this another way. I have a backup plan. Can you imagine that? Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Plan B. Plan B. Like plan B, good. Well, that involves me talking a little more, so. What it says is that uh, there was a man by the name of Captain William Swenson who recently was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions on September 8, 2009. It seems on that day that a column of American and Afghan troops were making their way through a part of Af Af Afghanistan to help protect a group of government officials who were going out to meet some local village elders. The column came under attack, and when they were ambushed and surrounded on three sides, Captain Swenson was recognized for running into live fire and rescuing the wounded and the dead. That were a result of the attack. One of the people he rescued was a sergeant. He'd been, uh, 
he and a comrade were making their way back to a medevac helicopter with his sergeant who had been shot in the neck. And what was remarkable about this day is that by sheer coincidence, one of the medevac medics happened to have one of those GoPro cameras on their helmet. Yeah. You guys seen these things? Yeah. And actually videotaped this whole scene on camera. And it shows Captain Swenson and his comrade bringing his wounded soldier who received a gunshot back to safety. And they put him on the helicopter. And then you see Captain Swenson bend over and give him a kiss before he turns around and goes back for more. Now, Simon says that I saw this and I thought to myself, where do people like this come from? What is that? What is, that is some deep, deep emotion. When you would do that, there's a love there. And I wanted to know, why is it that I don't have people like that that I work with? You know, in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. We have it backwards. So I ask myself, where do people like this come from? And my initial conclusion was that they're just better people. That's why they're attracted to the military. These better people are attracted to the concept of service. But that's completely wrong. It seems that he interviewed some of the heroes who had been in battle and had done the same thing that Captain Swenson did. And he asked them, why would you do it? Why did you do it? And they all say the same thing. Because they would have done it for me. Because they would have done it for me. It's this deep sense of trust and cooperation. So trust and cooperation are really important here. The problem with the concepts of trust and cooperation is that they're feelings and not instructions. I can't simply say to you, trust me, and you will. I can't simply instruct two people to cooperate, and they will. It's not how it works. It's a feeling. If you've ever been stuck with somebody in a group project, you know exactly how this works. You stick two people together and you tell them to cooperate. Sometimes it works, sometimes not so much. So it continues. Where does this feeling come from, this trust and cooperation? And he, he goes through and he says, you know, 50,000 years ago that people, uh, as they were evolving, that the, they found out that lived in tribes promoted safety safety in numbers. And whether it was animals or the weather, but everything was trying to kill them. Right? So, you had to learn to trust each other. While well, one slept, the other one stood watch. While well, that one stood watch, the other one slept. And this is the way that that trust and cooperation got developed. So, if I don't trust you, I'm not going to sleep real well, am I? And if I don't pull my part of it, you're not going to do your part. But if we both do, we're going to survive, we're going to have a better life. So he says the modern day is the same thing. The world is filled with danger. Things are trying to frustrate our lives and reduce our success, reduce our opportunity for success. It could be these ups and downs in the economy. It could be the stock market crashing. It could be your business that some new technology comes out and your business just goes south. Or it could be that your competition really is trying to kill you. Sometimes they're trying to put you right out of business. But at the very minimum, it's working hard to frustrate your growth and steal your business from you. We have no control over these forces. They are constant. And they are not going away. Now, wait a second. Now, here's one of these Bible moments I was telling you about. Does this sound familiar? 
in this world you're going to have trouble. Right? Does this sound familiar? Yeah. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ. Yeah. John 10.10. 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And guess what? It ain't stopping. It's just not going to stop. I wish it would, but it's not going to. Simon continues, the only variables that are the conditions inside an organization, and that's where leadership matters, because it's the leader that sets the tone. When a leader makes the choice to put the safety and the lives of people inside the organization first, to sacrifice their own comforts and sacrifice the tangible results so that people remain and feel safe and feel like they belong. Remarkable things happen. This guy's talking to businessmen. He's no preacher. But boy, does this sound like something I'm used to hearing about. It sounds like uh, Jesus once again who sacrificed everything. And I read the first part of John 10, 10. Let's listen to the second part. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Does that sound like that leader? The one that says, you know what? People are more important than prophets. The one that says, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice so that they can have something better. It's interesting how God's word is just true. And when people start to understand it, it makes all the difference. And I love the last part where he says that when people feel safe, they feel like they belong, and remarkable things happen. So he goes on, he says that he was on a flying trip, but he was witness to an incident where a passenger, if you've been in the airport and you've been trying to board a plane, you may have seen this, this pastor tried to get on the plane before his group's called. Well, the flight attendant, boarding officer, what have you, yells at this guy, just humiliates him. And he says, what do you have to, he talks to the, the person, he says, why do you have to treat us like cattle? Why can't you treat us like human beings? And this is exactly what she said to me. She said, sir, if I don't follow the rules, I could get into trouble or lose my job. What, he was, what she was really saying was, I don't feel safe, and I don't trust my leaders. Different environment, isn't it? She couldn't do what she wanted to do because of the way her leaders were going to react to her. Remember my saying, can't see it from my house? I just made the rule. I don't, her, her boss wasn't there to help her out, was it? No. She was on her own. And she had this rule. And if this rule wasn't obeyed, it's the X. You're done. At least that's the way she felt. And the way she treated other people then was a reflection of it. Continuing on, he says, if the conditions are wrong, we are forced to expend our own time and energy to protect ourselves from each other. And that inherently weakens the whole organization. When we feel safe inside organizations, we will naturally combine our talents and our strengths and work tirelessly to face the dangers outside and seize the opportunities. When we feel safe inside the organization, we'll work tirelessly to catch the vision, to push forward, to do things that we wouldn't have normally done. Does that sound like Romans, maybe? Chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. This is what Paul writes. Paul says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Connection. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, 
Speak up with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encouraging others, then be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Gladly. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Once again, Paul's words. All of you together are Christ's body. And each of you are part of it. We're connected. We're in this thing together. It's this organization. We're watching each other's back. One sleeps, the other one watches. We all have abilities. We all have things that we're good at, that God has gifted us at. And when, when that all works together, that's an amazing thing. Remarkable things happen. Things you wouldn't expect to happen, happen. So what makes a great leader? Because this is where it comes from, right? You first have to trust your leader. Simon says, the, the closest analogy I can give you to a great leader is like being a parent. If you think about what being a parent is, what would you want? What makes a great parent? We want to give our children opportunities, education, discipline them when necessary, and so they can grow up and achieve more. Great leaders want exactly the same thing. They want to provide their people opportunity, education, discipline when necessary, build their self-confidence, give them the opportunity to try and fail so that they can achieve more than we could ever imagine for ourselves. I think this is what we find in the church. I think this is what we find under Jesus Christ's leadership. That freedom, that safety, that knowledge that this is going to happen. John chapter 1, verses 49 and 51. Then Nathaniel explained, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will see heaven open up and angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, these abilities, these things open up. Heaven opens up. Blessings, strength, courage, safety, understanding, kindness. These things are all possible. Why? Because of Jesus Christ and Him making a way. He's, he's the way through. The way God blesses His church, His body. And all things. John 14, verses 11 through 13. Just believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done, and even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. And you can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. This is a different economy. This is not so I can get more stuff for myself. This is to bring glory to God. This is why we are here. This is the reason for the church. This is the reason why Christ is the head. So that we understand, as a head, a head directs what? Your arms, your legs, your fingers. It gets you going. It sets you to task. It says go here, you do. You think about your own body and the way it works. You don't go, fingers, pick up this iPad, and then not obey you? No, you tell them what they do. They just do. It's your brain, your head, the eyes, the mouth, the ears. It directs all these functions, the rest of the whole body. It's the same with the church. Christ is our head. He is directing us. He's telling us what he would like to see us doing. 
whether you be a finger or a toe or a foot or a ear or a mouth, no matter what it is. These things are kind of a mystery. It sounds kind of weird. It sounds kind of crazy. But this is the way God has set things up. I told you I was going to go and speak about Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And I wanted to tell you all those things about Christ being the head of the church, about us being the body, because the first sentence in this is going to throw you off. Because nobody talks about Christ being the head and the church being the body. They talk about the rest of the stuff in this passage. But listen as we go through it. Listen for what it says about Christ. Start at verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. He's the one calling his shots. He's the savior of his body, the church. Once again, who is he? The best, the top, the head, the one that sets the example. He's the standard. He's top of the class. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Christ gave his life up for for this church, for the church. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And if we are members of his body, as the scripture said, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illusion, or an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now I don't want to discount the, the husband and wife relationship at all. But I think we miss the other part of that that you can't understand the husband and wife relationship unless you really understand Christ and the church relationship. Unless you really get that. Because otherwise, you're stuck here. You're stuck with a world's standard of how things work. It's a hierarchy, right? It's like Burger King. Well, the boss. The boss can do whatever the boss wants, so the boss does. This is not the way it should be with us. This is backwards, isn't it? So what happens is, as you accept Christ in your life, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moves inside the circle. Now that's a little better. I mean, that's, that's better than outside, right? Now all of a sudden, at least the influence is, is more in your sphere, it's in your world. But it's still not good enough. Where we need to go God's Holy Spirit sits on my throne. And I am at the base of it, worshiping, listening, following directions. You see, I have to I have to be able to actually hear from Christ. I have to be able to hear his voice. I have to like long after his instructions. I need to read the word of God and understand it to be able to do everything I do in my entire life, whether it's going to work, whether it's relating to my family, whether it's doing any activity whatsoever. That's 
for me is to sit on my throne. I need Christ at the center of my life so that everything I do is led by the head of the body. This is the way God set it up. Sin came in and busted it and threw us on the throne. We're not equipped to do that. We're going to make some poor decisions. Bad calls. I know I made a bunch. Some of us are strong enough to admit them. But now, this is different. Where are we now? Is this where you're at? Is the Holy Spirit in the, on the throne? Jesus Christ the center of your life? I think this is where Revolution Church is called to be. This is why this place is different. Not because of anything other than what Christ is doing. We don't have any set agenda. There's no hierarchy. It's not about the comfort here. It's about the people. It's about the heart. It's about life change. It's about baptisms. I've been here for a little over a year, and I've seen more baptisms here than any other church I've ever been a part of. And why does that happen? Well, it's not by my power. It's not because of any of us. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ in the people that come into this church and enter with this body and are strengthened here, and they feel safe here. Because you know what? We don't stab each other in the back. We try to watch each other's back. When one of you is sleeping, one of us is awake. That's not what the world says to do, but that's what happens here. We look out for each other. When one of us gets into trouble, ten come running. Amen. This is what this church is, and this is why this happens. God blesses that. Ephesians is all about it. And this is what we're called to be. Ephesians 5.1. I want to read this to you. It says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Isn't this what God did? He came running. Jesus Christ. He said, Go down there and save those folks. I love those people, and I need them. You to save them, because they can't do it. Amen. Yeah. And so that's what he did. He came running. Yeah. That's what happens here. God is our power and our strength. Ephesians 2, verse 8. God saved you by His <laughs> grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Amen. I couldn't have done it. No law was going to get me there. I couldn't be good enough. None of us could. But His grace and His mercy. That's how. So it's not my strength. I can surrender to that. I can trust that. That's a leader that I can follow. Because you know what? I know he's got my best interests. I can feel safe there. I, I'm not like that airline attendant who said, you know what, I'm going to get fired. Oh or if you've ever been in a church where you didn't dress right, oh. or you didn't do the right things, oh well, God, well, shun the unbeliever, right? You're out of here. Oh what do they treat you like? That's not what happens here. We got people with tattoos. We got people with, with dressed in all fashions, all different ways, and they're accepted because they're people. Because God loves them. Ephesians 2:10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ, so that we can do the good things He planned for us a long time ago. Now wait a second. How am I going to do the things that He planned if I can't hear His voice? If he's not my head, if he's not my center, if he's not sitting on the throne giving me directions, who's giving directions? Me. Well, wait a second. He's out of here. How good is this going to work? I can't hear him if he's not within us giving directions. We are in God's kingdom, Ephesians 2.13. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. This is Christ's headship. If not for Jesus Christ, it doesn't happen. You just can't be good enough. You can't just say, I believe in God. You can't just do something. There's no way to earn it. It's been done for you. Amen. And you need to accept it. To see it for what it is, for what it is the truth. It sets you free. It takes the burden away. I don't have to be 
trying so stinking hard. I can trust in my Savior who's done it for me. We are God's church. We're the body of Christ. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family together. We are in his house, built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling, where, God's, where God lives by his spirit. I didn't just make this up. This comes out of the Bible. What's it say? It says, through him, you Gentiles will be made a part of his dwelling, where God lives by his spirit. So this is me. This is his spirit. Where's his spirit living? Me, you, 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 each one of us. And so when Paul said in, in Ephesians 5, when he said it's a great mystery how the two become one, talking about husband and wife, and he said this is an illustration of Christ. I don't know how this happens, but I know it does. This is his plan. This is how this works. Why would he do this? Why would God do this? So the world would know him. Ephesians 3.10 God's purpose in all his, this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. We need a greater appetite for God. Because you know what? He displays himself. This guy that I was going to show you the video, the thing I went through, the transcript of what he said, that was God, wasn't it? These were principles that God has put in his Bible. It's there for us to read. This is not something new that this guy that's genius just discovered for the business world, that you're supposed to treat people with respect, that you're supposed to breed a safe environment for your employees, and that they would achieve amazing things. This has been God's plan from the beginning. Amen. He has a throne to sit on. It's in your heart. But if you don't know that, and you don't hear from him, you need to communicate. I'm going to close with these, these four points. God's on the throne. Jesus Christ is in your heart. The Holy Spirit is in one within you. You gotta pray. You gotta pray. John 14, 13. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Jesus' words. You gotta pray. You gotta talk to the guy. God, what would you have me do? This is going on down here. Do you see this? You see this mess? This mess I'm in? These things that are going on in my life? Do you see these troubles? What, which way do I turn? Which way do I go? What would I do? You gotta pray. Second thing, he's gonna talk back. Okay, that sounds kind of weird, but he is. He's gonna talk back. John 10, verse 27 and 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Wait a second. This is Jesus talking again. My sheep know my voice. They listen to it. Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, in one within me. You know, we know his voice. Guess what? We probably know it now. You know when he's talking to you. You don't you? You know when he's saying, don't do that. Go the other way. Or when he says, you know what, that, that homeless guy that you just passed? Yeah. Maybe you should turn around. Maybe you should buy him a burger at McDonald's and turn around and go back. You ever hear that voice? It's not like an audible thing. It's not like the heavens open up. It's just a still small voice that says, hey, guess what? You know what? You know how to go back. 
you know what? Maybe you should call your mom. Maybe you should talk to her. Maybe oh. she misses you. Maybe you should know that guy that you did the wrong thing and you, just, you took his money and ripped him off. Maybe you should go make that right. You ever hear that voice? I do. I'm starting to hear it better. I'm starting to hear it more and more. Third thing, ask rightly. We start out asking for all sorts of things in our prayers. God, may I do well on this test? God, please don't let my car break down the way to work. God, fill Aunt Martha's bunions. I mean, we do. We pray for all these things, and those are good things to pray for. But I think there's something more. I think your prayer life evolves. You start to pray for other things, something a little bigger. Because as the Spirit moves within you, as you start hearing this voice and you're praying, man, your life starts opening up. Paul, once again, has this prayer in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Listen to what he says. When I think of all this, I fall on my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resource, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ through it is through it is not, though it is not understood fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Amen. That's a little better than Aunt Martha's bunions. Do you get the scope of this? That all of a sudden you start realizing who you're talking to in your prayers. This is God Almighty. This is the one that, that created all things, as Paul says. This is the one that empowers, that changes heart, that his love indwells within you. Oh, I just want so much for you folks, all you people, all my brothers and sisters. Oh, I hope that you live with this daily. I hope it impacts you. I hope it convicts you. I hope that you hear his voice and your heart explodes with this thought of Christ and what he's done and what he's telling you to do in the life that you can have through him, with him. Life abundant. So why? Why would you want to do all that? That sounds like a lot of hard work. Yeah. A lot of hard things to do. i got to sacrifice what I want, put the Holy Spirit. Are you kidding me? Why would I want to do that? And why would I want to treat you guys as, well, you, you know you're good people, but, you know, come on. Hey, I got things. Yeah. I got my agenda, yeah. right? Why would I want to sacrifice for you? Do you remember Captain Swenson? Remember what he said when he was asked, why did you do that? Why would you run into live fire? Why would you go someplace where you're going to die? For somebody else. Why did you do it? Because they would have done it for me. I trust you folks. I really do believe that you do it for me. I really do. And you know what? I hope that some of you are starting to see that I would do it for you. And I can say that. And I can be safe in that. Because in this church, it's led by Jesus Christ who already did it for us. He set that standard. He already had our back. He did it for us. So what do we do in our response? Where are you now? Take account of yourself, Paul says. Sober account, humbly. Where are you with this? Where is Jesus Christ? Is he at the center? Is that where you're at now? Maybe he's not. Maybe he's a little off-center. 
Maybe he's outside. Maybe you're not sure. It's time to take account. Because now that you know, that's where you are now. You guys pray with me. Father, we just can't imagine really how the depth, the height, the, the width of your love, how far it goes. Lord, everything around us screams, I, 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 me, 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 and not help others. But you're, you're 180 degrees from that. That's not what you say. Lord, you, you created the heavens. You created all things. You know the way, the way we're supposed to work, the way that love is supposed to happen through us, with us. You included us in that. You are the author of love. You are love. What would the world be like, Lord, if we all had each other's back? I pray for each one of us here tonight. May we come a little closer to allowing you to sit on our throne in our life, if we haven't already. And if we have, if we've already surrendered that throne over to you, Father, would you expand that? Would you just blow it up? May it shine like a light that just is undeniable, that others would want it, desire it, see it, feel it. And not, not that we would be glorified, no. but they would know the living God and how much he loves us, each one of us, loving us until death, death on a cross. And Lord, may, when the next time we hear your command and we ask, why should I do that? May we remember because you already did it for us. That's why. And that's plenty good enough. Thank you, Father. All in your son's name. Amen. Dwayne is going to give our uh, communion thought tonight. You guys are going to pass it out.
very, very nice. I think after what you said, uh, like Kelly said, that's it. We had the people got home. Very nice of them. I think the guys are all awesome over here. So it's nice to see that we have a large group tonight. I know Moses, Kyle, Dan, and the rest of us really love the fact that uh, that's going to Everybody get uh, communion? All right. We understand what the communion is, what it's all about, right? So I'm not going to read it out of the Bible. This is the body that God gave up, or Christ gave up for us. Jesus Christ gave this up for us so that we may have new life. He died on the cross for our sins forever. So he was with his disciples and he said, take this in remembrance of me. It's an amazing thing. So he told the disciples to drink this. I'm 